Um, the talk is uh, called Engineering Evidence First first and foremost, because I think that someone needs to write a paper with this title. It's just such an amazing title. Uh, if you work in conceptual engineering and you, 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 know, you don't publish uh, a paper with this title, such a shame. Um, but also because this is um, as it were, the conceptual engineering counterpart of my project in epistemology um, that um, was concerned until very recently um, with uh, trying to account for the phenomenon of resistance to evidence. Um, and in the process of, of you know, working on that project, I figured out that the folk conception of evidence and the philosophical conception of evidence um, are quite different they're they're quite you know uh incompatible really um and i found that very strange because you know in other in other walks of life we like to kind of at least not be uh, you know uh, not propose accounts that are strongly incompatible with folk theories um and then and then you know i thought well maybe that's not really a problem at the end of the day you know why should the psychologists care that the uh, uh, correct account of depression doesn't match folk intuitions about uh, depression um but looking more into the issue i think that i came to believe but you're going to tell me now if i'm mistaken um i think i came to believe that folk are right and we are wrong um uh, about evidence, or to be a bit, to put it a bit more nuanced, I think that they are more right than we are. So the 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 correct uh, things that we should think about evidence um, are closer to what they think about evidence than to what we think about evidence. So that's by way of a mysterious introduction. Uh, but let me tell you more precisely what what I have in mind. So. Obviously, we care a lot about evidence in philosophy, right, in many quarters of philosophy, in epistemology, field of science, field of law, in the literature of moral responsibility, and so on. Um, and of course, there's a, one of the reasons why we care so much about evidence in philosophy is because, you know, we care a lot about evidence uh, in all walks of life, right? So the concept of evidence is highly employed in law, um, in history, in science, in journalism. Um, and also we talk about evidence to each other all the time in everyday life, right? So it's a pretty central concept. Um, and as I was saying, if one uh, digs a bit into the history of this concept, one discovers this puzzling fact that we have strongly incompatible accounts of evidence one has in philosophy and in everyday life. So what I'm going to be talking about is not just evidence in general, but had evidence, evidence one has. Um, so you don't need to go very far to discover that. You can just open up the, the Stanford Encyclopedia article on evidence that starts by saying, well, usually people think that pieces of evidence are, you know, fingerprints and as, other such objects. Well, in philosophy, we think they're mental states. <laughs> so yeah, wow, really, that seems, that seems strange. Um, so the project, my, the project that I am, that I want to take on now um, is one of unification. So I would want to, I kind of want to engineer a unified conception of evidence had that serves both philosophical functions and um, practical functions. So I want a new account of evidence that serves both functions such that we don't work with two totally incompatible ones anymore. Um, and the proposal very roughly is going to be that we should think of, of evidence had as available knowledge, knowledge probability raisers. So facts that are available to us and that raise the probability of us knowing. All right, let's see how I'm going to do that. So first I'm going to introduce the puzzle in more detail and try to diagnose it um, as, you know, as much as I can. And then I'm going to defend, uh, you know, this engineering uh, project. Now, I want to tell you from the beginning that this is this is genuinely a very much work in progress uh, thing. In that I kept working on the slides, for instance, today, not because uh, the slides weren't pretty enough, but because I kept changing my mind about stuff. So it's uh, it's been in progress until half an hour ago. Um, and you know, you know how when junior people say this is work in progress, they usually lie and they they come with this super polished 
think, uh, just to give the impression to more senior people, that that's how in progress looks for them. Well, in this case, I used to do that a lot as well. Um, well, in this case, that's not what you're going to get. So you're not going to get the super polished thing uh, that's only pretends uh, in progress. It actually is in progress. Um, so, you know, what the ambition is that you're going to throw a lot of objections at, at me. I'm going to try to answer them as, as best as I can. And at the end of the discussion, I'm actually going to have a paper uh, as, as opposed to just a list of, you know, a bullet points, as it were, what they, which is what I have right now. Right. So the philosophical accounts of having evidence since Plato, um, as it were, are very different from while, how people tend to think, normal people tend to think about uh, evidence. Historically in philosophy, having evidence has been spelled out in terms of being in a particular mental site, state or another. So I'm going to refer to this understanding of evidence um, uh, as feel evidence. Um, so that for some reason, we always thought that this having relation pertains to uh, stuff being in one's head. Uh, internalism, of course, trivially thinks that evidence is in one's head. They think that pieces of evidence are experiences or seemings or something along these lines. But even externalism um, is not, not going very far in the opposite direction in that, you know, the, the, you know, the most prominent externalists on the market think that evidence one has are, for instance, pieces of knowledge or facts taken up by our reliable abilities in the case of virtue epistemologists, and we can go on. But the point is that the having relation uh, unites the two camps in thinking that it pertains to you know, being in one's head. So for some reason, we think that we only have evidence insofar as we take them out from the world and we squeeze them <laughs> in within our skull. That's, that's what we all have in common in philosophy and um, uh, since you know, Plato. So because we think that, uh, and this is something that I've, that I've defended in the, my previous project on resistance to evidence that I was telling you about, we have difficulties in philosophy diagnosing resistance to evidence and normative defeat. In particular, we have difficulties diagnosing what's wrong with this phenomena, right? So we often fa are faced with people who refuse to take up very strong evidence lying right in front of them right? Um, sexist people refuse to take up women testimony, racists, uh, Trumpists refuse to take up any evidence that suggests that Trump is a bad guy, right? Wishful thinkers and so on, right? So all of these people are characterized by the fact that they have a lot of evidence lying around them, but they don't take it up. They don't take it from the world and put it in their head, right? So if you're going to have an account of having evidence that has to do with inside the skull, you're not going to be able to say the kind of, you know, commonsensical thing that any fault person would say, uh, something like, well, these Trump supporters have a lot of evidence that Trump is a bad guy, but they refuse to believe it. You can't say that if you want to say that having evidence needs to be something that's happening in your head. Because these people, by definition, refuse to believe all of these things, right? So they just don't take this information up from the environment. So here's a case, um, you know, it's going to be hard now to build a case that addresses all possible accounts of evidence or, or historically extant accounts of evidence, but it's, I'm sure that you're going to be able to see how you can twist it and twitch it if you want to, if you want it to be problematic for your preferred account of evidence, and if not, we can discuss it in the Q&A, but here's a case, right? So I call this case friendly detective. Detective Dave is investigating a crime scene. Dave is extremely thorough. But at the same time, he's a close friend of the butlers. Dave finds conclusive evidence that the butler did it, the butler's gloves covered in blood, his fingerprints on the murder weapon, a letter written by the butler confessing to the crime. But he fails to form the corresponding beliefs. He doesn't believe any of this. Dave just can't get himself to believe any of this because he can't get himself to believe that his friend, the butler, would do such a thing. So this is a classical case of uh, you know, the epistemology of, the epistemology of friendship, right? We, we know these cases uh, from, from the literature on partiality and friendship. So it's not, a, you know, I didn't invent this case. Um, so what's going on in this case is by stipulation, Detective Dave has a lot of evidence lying around, but he refuses to believe it. So there's absolutely no mental states that Detective Dave um, hosts um, such that he can count as having the evidence by a mental state account of evidence, right? 
Uh, and you can see how you can, you know, then go into detail depending on what your favorite account is. So if you're a knowledge firster, you can say, well, Dave doesn't believe all of this stuff, therefore he doesn't know it. If you're a virtual uh, reliabilist, you can say, well, Dave is just not picking this, uh, this facts up with any virtue uh, and so on, right? So, you know, folk people are able to say Dave has a lot of evidence and nevertheless refuses to believe the butler did it. We can't as philosophers because we don't have an account of having evidence that allows us to say that. Um, okay, correspondingly, we're gonna have difficulties diagnosing uh, normative defeat. And what I'm gonna refer to when I say normative defeat in this talk, I'm gonna refer to mere normative defeat. So defeat that's not psychological, that's not believed. Defeat that's just out there in the world. So consider the following case, stubborn scientist Bill carries out an experiment to test his hypothesis that P, the experiment strongly supports that P and thereby Bill comes to believe that P. A colleague of his, George, however, discovers a serious flaw with Bill's experiment, which she points out to Bill. Stubbornly, however, Bill discounts George's word and maintains his belief that P. Alternatively, if you're an, if you're an internalist and you want this case to apply to your account of evidence as well, imagine that uh, Bill doesn't even bother to listen uh, to George. He just tunes out when he hears George talking about his failed experiment. Uh, also, again, plug in whatever you need to plug into this case. Uh, if you're the kind of knowledge person that doesn't like knowledge defeat, you can just stipulate that uh, Bill's belief is indeed false. So it's not a case of knowledge that 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 is somehow, on your view, would entitle Bill to, to be resistant to George's testimony. So again, if we think that evidence one has is just in one's head, it, it will turn out that Bill doesn't do anything wrong here because he has no evidence uh, that his uh, experiment is flawed. Therefore, he can go ahead and uh, believe that P. Okay, so here are, th these are problems that I've noticed in, in previous work. Uh, but here is a problem that's more um, pertains more to the subject of the talk today. This results in very problematic misfit with folk representational needs, uh, which in turn are of course sourced in folk practical needs, right? Um, so in particular, what's happening because of uh, because of this problem is that our philosophical con uh, conception of evidence cannot play the function that folk needs it to play, right? So. Notice that you can't come in front of a judge and say that you had no evidence for P just because you were not paying attention or refusing to accept the facts supporting P that were lying in plain view, right? That is not gonna be something you can say in front of a judge. Um, so you can't, you, we can't work with this conception of evidence in law, in law, in practice, right? We can't work with this conception of evidence in journalism. Journalists won't get off the hook for misinforming because they ignore defeat. That's not, that's not a good thing, right? You can't as a journalist uh, come and say, well, I just ignored testimony to the contrary, therefore I didn't have evidence against um, this article that I wrote or whatever. Um, similarly, detectives, again, won't count as not having had evidence just because they refuse to believe facts pointing to their friend's guilt, right? So it, that's not a, good, not, not a good thing, right? So if, if we are in philosophy in a situation in which, you know, our super well spread account of evidence, it, you know, is such that is not going to deliver for folk at all. That's, that's, I think, problematic, right? I mean, it, it, it's one thing to have a more specialized account of what depression is. It's another thing to try to theorize uh, about, about a, a concept that's so useful in everyday life and in other scientific fields. Uh, in a way that's totally disconnected from the function that this, func this concept is supposed to play in this field. So uh, one thing that you might think is, well, maybe, maybe we have tools, maybe you're rushing a bit through this talk. Um, maybe uh, people have been discussing uh, lately evidence that one should have had, right? Sandy Goldberg very notably has a paper entitled exactly like that. Um, and he thinks, for instance, that what's at stake is a social should. So he thinks, uh, that, for instance, the detective um, should have formed all of those beliefs about the murder weapon and so on, uh, because we have social expectations from the detective to do his job well, which were breached by him in this particular case. 
Right. Now, the problem with an account like this more generally is that there are many social shoots out there. Unfortunately for us, most of them are not really that great. We are not perfect society with perfect social norms. There are also social shoots that say in many places that you shouldn't listen to women, and that's not a good social should. So if that's going to deliver epistemic normativity, uh, we are going to end up with an account whereby not only is it the case that socially you shouldn't listen to women, but you're going to end up with an account on which epistemically is perfectly fine to ignore them. So that's not that's not ideal, right? Um, and also, there's just going to be social shoots that are epistemically irrelevant, right? So there's uh, uh, there's going to be social shoots that press on me to get informed about stuff that have nothing to that have nothing to do with epistemology, right? So I'm going, for instance, now there's a social should pressing on me to learn how to play the piano because my kids are studying piano in school and it would be good for them if I could you know, help them study. Uh, so that's a sh social should, uh, but I, I do wanna say that I don't have any ep epistemic duty to do that. Um, and another, another account that might do it for us is Williamson's account. So Williamson thinks uh, that what's happening in these cases is that there's an epistemic should sourced in dispositions. So he thinks, well, obviously, you know, there's an epistemic should that says that you should have good rather than bad epistemic dispositions. And he thinks that when you don't take up easily available uh, evidence, what's happening is you're displaying a bad epistemic disposition. Uh, and how do we know that? Well, someone with a good epistemic disposition would have taken up this, uh, this pieces of evidence. So he wants to say that that's the source of this uh, should in the evidence you should have had. Someone with your epistemic, with better epistemic dispositions would have taken up this, uh, these facts from the world. Therefore, you should have taken them up as well. So the problem with this, with Williamson's account, one problem is that it's too strong in that it can be a one of failure that you're um, engaging in. It, it need not be a uh, manifestation of a bad epistemic disposition. Uh, but even if you get, if Tim can get around this, I think that, and if even if Sandy manages to give us a, uh, you know, an in principle distinction between the relevant and the irrelevant social shoulds, I think that the, both accounts share a. Uh, a weakness in common in that they are too weak, they overgeneralize. So uh, it's, it's important to distinguish between the diachronical epistemic should of inquiry versus the synchronical epistemic should of justification, right? So there are some shoots of inquiry that are not going to affect my justificatory status, right? So I Maybe it is epistemically true that I should, you know, inquire more into the nature of evidence because that would be, you know, good for me epistemically um, because that would, you know, get me to have a fuller account of what evidence is or, um, you know, get me a lot of knowledge or whatever your, your you know, epistemic consequentialist wants to say about that. Um, but compatibly, this this need not affect my justificatory status. So it is not the case that, you know, evidence that I should be looking for um, affects my justification, justificatory status in the same way in which available evidence just lying in plain view uh, does. And this, this difference between this epistemic should is very hard to capture if all you want to say is that what's happening in these resistance cases is um, uh, res resistance to evidence that one should have had. Right. So here is, in order to illustrate what I'm talking about, consider the following variation on the friendly detective case. In this case, Dave is investigating the crime scene with his colleague Greg this time. So Greg is um, rather lazy and distracted. He fails to find any evidence at the crime scene because he's just walking around and looking, uh, looking very distractedly at, uh, at the crime scene and concludes that there's no evidence to suggest that the butler did it. In contrast to Greg, Dave is extremely thorough, right? But at the same time, he's a close friend of the butlers, if you remember. So Dave, Dave finds all of this conclusive evidence that the butler did it at the crime scene, right? The fingerprints, the letter, and so on. But he just for, fails to form the corresponding beliefs. So now notice that both Dave and Greg are rather rubbish detectives, right? So the social shoots there are definitely broken by both, right? They definitely fail to... Uh, conduct their inquiry well. They are both in breach of the diachronic epistemic should of inquiry, right? Uh, as well as of the social professional should for that matter. Uh, also, it is the case that both Dave and Greg display pretty bad epistemic dispositions. 
All right, Dave is a sloppy epistemic agent, while Greg fails to believe what the evidence supports, so they both display bad epistemic dispositions. So far, none of the accounts we've been looking at is going to be able to distinguish between what's going on in Dave's case and what's going on in Greg's case. Compatibly, though, there's an important epistemic difference I would like to submit before Dave and Greg. Dave, but not Greg, is aware of all the evidence in support of the hypothesis that the butler did it. It's all lying in plain view, and he just refuses to form the relevant beliefs, right? So Dave is the one who's resistant to available evidence. Greg just doesn't search for it, right? There's a, there's a big, um, you know, minus on Dave's part that Greg just doesn't have because he, you know, he's just a lazy inquirer. Uh, now, all of this, or everything that I said so far suggests that our philosophical way of thinking about evidence had a, something that needs to be within the skull is problematic. Um, now, you know, one thing that we could do is go back to, you know, to nature as it were, go back to the fault understanding and see what went wrong. Maybe we, we did something wrong where we tried to do analysis uh, and when we started with the folk understanding. If we look, however, in the folk understanding, and when I say folk, I mean, you know, quite specialized understandings in corners of academic work, like, for instance, in law and, uh, and in medicine. Uh, these people discuss evidence as objective probability enhancers. That's what they think it is. They just think it is uh, that for something uh, to be a piece of evidence for something else, it needs to be the case that it enhances the probability of that happening. That's all. So that's, a, that's the simple account that's used everywhere uh, in all these domains that we've been talking about. And this is not a great account either. So we can't really go back to the folk understanding of evidence. And it's not great for either the functions that it's supposed to serve for them, for judges and for detectives and you know, for, for journalists, nor is it an account that we, with our uh, philosophical understanding of this phenomenon, can accept. And here, here are the problems. Um, so the, the one problem pertains to, as I said, to the practical function of this concept that it, that is supposed to serve for you know judges, judges and journalists alike. Um, it's supposed to serve to punish people, right? And so it's supposed to um, uh, serve to say, well, you had a lot of evidence that P is the case, so you knew that P is the case, so you have no excuse to have done what you did. That's what they do with this account, right? But that that function cannot be solved because of availability constraints. If you think of it, evidence in terms of objective probability enhancer simpliciter, you're going to punish people for stuff that they just could not have known about, right? Because we are limited uh, creatures. We can't really know uh, all, the, all the things that enhance the um, you know, probabilities, right? There's only so much information that we can be expected to pick up from our environments. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, for instance, me being put on trial um, based on the fact that given that I know piano axioms, I, uh, you know, have evidence for all arithmetical truths. Now, I want to say that that's flattering, but I think, <laughs> you know, unreasonably harsh. Um, so it, it seems as though even for the practical purposes that this folk account of evidence serves, we need some availability constraints on this objective probability enhancers, right? Because otherwise we don't know whom to punish and whom we shouldn't punish. Uh, but more philosophically speaking, there's a serious theoretical problem that we have known about in philosophy for a while and that actually motivates uh, moving towards the knowledge of first epistemological pictures, the accidental correlation problem, Norman the clairvoyant, remember? So what we in philosophy know about Norman, folk people and judges, they don't. Um, so just because something, a fact, increases the probability of another fact obtaining, it doesn't follow that that's a piece of evidence that I have or that I can even have. So the fact that you are wearing a red dress may well accidentally be strongly correlated, unbeknownst to me, with it raining in Spain. Um, now, just because I see you wearing a red, red dress, I can't be expected to, to have any idea about this correlation and nor indeed about it raining in Spain. So this accidental correlation problem makes the folk account also theoretically very unsuitable. So we can't really take it, just take it up and abandon um, you know, all these years of epistemological theorizing uh, either. There's a puzzle. 
So the, the, the diagnosis that I would like to submit to you is that these two conceptions serve different practical and representational functions, or to, to put it differently, they have done, they've, they've been designed historically to serve different practical and representational functions, and that's what got them to be so distinct from each other and indeed incompatible. So remember Gary Watson's idea, uh, correct idea, I want to say, that there are two faces of responsibility, account accountability and attributability. Uh, so I think the way I think about Gary Watson project is as being a, a project in conceptual, enge conceptual engineering in that he noticed that the concept of responsibility alone can't do the work that we wanted to, work, to do. In particular, we want to say about someone who's vicious, who has a vicious character, but through no fault of their own, we want to say that there's something blameworthy about them, but we can't really say that it's their fault because it, by stipulation, they ended up being vicious through no fault of their own, right? Um, so in order to account for this case is Gary Watson introduces this distinction between ac accountability, it's your fault, um, and attributability, cases in which it's not your fault that you know, you're a bad guy or whatever, you just grew up in a horrible environment that led to this, uh, but it is attributable to you. You are, as a matter of fact, a bad guy, right? So these, are, these two faces, I think, of responsibility are captured, uh, each of them uh, in turn, by, by the two accounts of evidence that we looked at, uh, but they're not both captured by any. So I want to say that feel evidence, so this kind of account that says that evidence had this, whatever it is, it's, you know, somewhere within the skull, um, is, is motivated by a historical focus on proper reasoning, by a Cartesian type of project, right, looking into what we should do well in our head epistemically. Um, doing well inside the head has, has been a major concern for 2000 years in epistemology, right? Um, so proper processing facts once you've already taken them up from the environment. That's what we cared about for such a long time, right? Uh, so as a result, it's going to serve to pick out attributability because now that it's in my head, of course, it's attributable to me, but it fails to pick out accountability. That's exactly what's going on in cases of resistance to evidence and normative defeat, right? It's accountability that's being picked uh, there. And that's why this account doesn't do well. On the other hand, folk evidence has been designed to serve a different function. The historical focus there was on practical and legal consequences of having evidence, right? So as a result, it does better at picking out accountability, right? But fails to pick out attributability. So the folk evidence account does, doesn't have the problem um, of resistance to evidence because of course it, it, it basically predicts that each and every fact that enhances the probability is a piece of evidence. Um, what the problem is that it doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything about attributability. It doesn't tell us anything about when it is that we can attribute a particular uh, piece of evidence to a subject. Um, so that's what I think happened. I mean, this might be rough, I, th I think. It might not be quite like this. It might be, you know, a bit fuzzy around the edges, but I think that that's uh, insofar as we want to speculate about what happened, how we ended up with such distinct and opposing accounts of evidence, I think this is at least a helpful way to think about it um, in order to know what to do next. At least it's been helpful for me. So my proposal is an exercise in unification uh, as I like them. I like them guided by functions. So I, I want this exercise to be guided by, by the epistemic function uh, that this concept is supposed to play. Uh, so the, my proposal is to engineer a novel concept of having evidence that serves both representational functions that we need to we need served in everyday life and in philosophy. So to engineer a concept of evidence that picks out both accountability and attributability and thereby serves the practical and the theoretical functions that we are after uh, equally well. So here is one objection that I want to I want to address before I even tell you how this project looks like, because this is probably otherwise going to bug you during the entire the rest of the, entire, the, the talk. You might wonder, how is this an exercise in conceptual engineering uh, rather than just a new account of evidence? Why is it that what, what you're doing here is an, um, an exercise in engineering rather than just saying, well, we only have crappy accounts of evidence on the market. Let's, here's the correct account by me. Uh, here is why. 
So I think that I think the border is very thin between accounts of conception engineering and uh, and analysis. Uh, I think that the, the project that I'm engaging here is not one in conceptual engineering, it's one in conception engineering. I think that the concept of evidence is what it is in you know, the platonic heaven where I like it to be. And I, don't th I think that the correct way to think about it is that we've been wrong about evidence, not that we've been right, but we should have a different concept. I think we've just been wrong, us philosophers and fall people. We've all been wrong about evidence. But I do think that this is an exercise in conceptual engineering rather than a mere project and analysis in the sense it, in which it doesn't just challenge some features of existent accounts uh, to propose a new account. It rather challenges an assumption that under uh, under uh, under rights all accounts that we know of uh, in philosophy. So in that way, it's, a, it's an exercise in conception engineering. I'm not saying here's my account of evidence is better than Ernie Sosa's and Tim Williamson's. What I'm saying is all accounts of evidence in philosophy have assumed this particular thing and that this particular thing is mistaken. We should engineer our conception, our philosophical conception of uh, evidence as, and as well, we should engineer our folk conception of evidence because that doesn't serve its purpose well either. So in a nutshell, what I want to say is, look, it's hard to draw the line. Uh, there's, if you're a Platonist like me, you're going to think there are very few con you know, projects in conceptual engineering. You're going to think that projects are either in, either proposing to pick up a different concept from the platonic heaven and put it into use, or you're going to think that the project is just a conception engineering uh, project. But remember the traditional projects that, you know, everybody in this literature cites as mainstream projects in conceptual engineering. Take, for instance, the um, Clark and Chalmers uh, project about um, the extended mind, where they engineer belief to not only be something in the head, but rather, um, you know, be able to include features of the environment. So in a way, I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying, look, just like Clark and Chalmers said, stop thinking of belief as something in the head. I'm saying, stop thinking of evidence had as something in the head. That's, that's the kind of project. So if you think Clark and Chalmers had an engineering project, then you're going to think I have one as well. Uh, here is a, I, I thought maybe, maybe this doesn't work. Uh, I put it together uh, today just to respond to this objection. Uh, here is how to, to draw the line. Here's a proposal for a sufficiency condition for conception engineering. A project will be a project in conception engineering rather than a project in mere analysis insofar as it targets for revision a feature that is assumed by all or the vast majority of conceptions of X in the target group. So since I'm targeting a feature that's assumed by the vast majority of philosophical accounts um, of having evidence, i.e. the inside the skull uh, feature, I take myself to be in, involved in conception engineering. Right, so the method for this project um, is going to be function first, no surprise there for people who know the, my work. Um, I want I want to say so. What that means is not you know it sounds fancier than it is. It just means that we're going to be guided in our engineering project by the function. We're going to engineer something that serves the function that we want it to serve, and the relevant functions I take it are going to be practical and representational. Uh, in what way do I mean practical? I think that we need the con the way it works is practical functions motivate representational functions. So I think that the way it norm normally works is we need a concept, the concept of X, and we need it because we need to pick out X's from the world. But we don't need to pick out all X's from the world. There are a lot of X's around us that we never bothered to pick out. Uh, we need to pick out X's because picking out X's is useful to us in some way or another. So picking out you know, evidence is useful to us in one way or another, picking out the first half of the leg of this uh, of this table is not. That's why we don't have an, a word for it. So contrast conceptualized ethic X's with non-conceptualized X's, and that's what you get. When there are practical reasons to pick out a particular X, we conceptualize it. That's what we do. So in that sense, I want to say that the practical function of a concept matters as well for engineering purposes. I do want to, however, stress that it's only going to matter insofar as it does not, uh, as it were, undermine the representational function. So I don't like projects who come and say, let's 
let's destroy the concept representationally for this fantastic practical function. Not because I don't agree that the practical function is the most important. Survival is all that matters, I agree. The problem is that this that we're talking about representational devices and because they're representational devices, they wear their main function up their sleeve. Their main function is a representational uh, one. And what happens when a device has its main function a representational function is that all other functions are served in virtue of this representational function being served. So the way in which a concept serves its practical function is via serving its representational function. The concept of woman, for instance, serves its practical function of, uh, I don't know, subordinating women via representing them, right? You can subordinate to women in many ways. We can keep them at home, not allow them to go to work and to uni, but you can also subordinate them via representing them in a particular way. And that's how the concept does it. So what we see here is that the main function is the representational one and all the other functions are going to ride on this in this sense. So that's why I want to say that we should engineer concepts for practical functions, but only insofar as we don't get representational loss as a result. All right. So here are some ingredients. What we've seen so far suggests that these are necessary ingredients for, for the correct um, view that we need uh, to, to kind of accommodate the functions um, that we want this concept to play. First of all, no skull constraints. I couldn't stress this uh, more. The skull limits are irrelevant to the having relation. That's what the, the phenomenon of resistance to evidence shows us in the phenomenon of normative defeat, right? I can resist evidence outside and inside of my skull alike. The skull doesn't matter. There can be facts in my, in my psychology that I have trouble accessing because of my biases. There can be facts in the world that I have trouble accessing because of my biases as well. There's absolutely no uh, difference between within and outside uh, the skull. And another thing that we learned is that we definitely need some availability constraints, right? So the constraints are not going to be the limits of my skull. So that's not what's going go, what's going to constrain our account of having evidence, but we do need it constrained, right? We've seen that the folk account is too liberal. We need, we need it constraints by some availability constraints because I just don't have access to all arithmetical truths because we're limited. Uh, creatures. There's only so much stuff that we can be expected to process. So here's here's the account that I favor. I used to think uh, I worked on this account previously, and I used to think that uh, this is an account of what it is uh, for something to be evidence for a subject. And I want to say that this is the account that we should take uh, on board for um, evidence that one has. So. You know, it's a, there's a lot of text there. I'm going to read it to you, but it's it, it's quite a simple account. All the account says is that um, evidence one has is, is made out of facts that enhance the probability of knowledge and that uh, are available to the subject. So fact F is a protanto prima facie. Uh, uh, S is evidence that P is the case if and only if F is available to S. And I'm going to talk a bit more about what I mean by this availability constraint. And in normal conditions, the objective probability of knowledge that P conditional and proper basing on F and absent defeat is higher than the unconditional objective probability of knowledge that P. Again, many words to just say the probability of knowledge is increased if you base your belief on this particular fact. That's what makes it an evidence. So it doesn't increase. Uh, so it, it's, it's a bit similar to the folk conception of evidence in that it is about increasing probabilities, but it's not the increasing probabilities that the fact obtains, but it is, it's increasing the probability of knowledge that the fact um, obtains. So in that, it takes care of the accidental correlation uh, problem. So of course, the, the interesting thing that's going to make this account good or bad is the availability constraint, right? Because uh, otherwise, I'm not going to do much better uh, than the full conception if I don't have any constraints uh, on this. May, I can base my beliefs on many facts that I you know, have, haven't even heard of. Uh, and that can increase the probability of, of knowledge. But I obviously not, of, not all of th those facts are part of my uh, bag of evidence, as it were. It's only the ones that are easily available to me. So we need to know what this availability is all about. So I want to say that this availability pertains to a constrained version of what implies can. I don't like what implies can when it's a agential. I think, I think it's false. But I think that a version, a restricted version of it is correct when it's restricted to the type 
of, of agent. So I think this availability should track a psychological can for an average cognizer of the sort exemplified. So if you think back to, to the cases of resistance to evidence, um, what I want to say is that what's going wrong, what's going wrong in the case of the, uh, of the detective is that someone like him, an average cognizer like him, uh, could have easily taken up those pieces of evidence, right? The fingerprints and whatever, the, the letter from the butler and so on, right? Maybe for him it wasn't easy because he, he was biased in favor of his butler friend, but for someone like him, the kind of cognizer that he, he is, it's easy to take up that kind of fact. So I wanna say that there are qualitative limitations on availability in that there's gonna be types of information that we just can't access in virtue of the type of people that we are, right? So I can access the fact that there's a table in front of me right now, but I can't access the fact that you decided secretly to put a table in the other room without my knowing. That's just the kind of person I am. I can't see through the walls. Um, and there's also, while we are in the qualitative field, there's also types of support relations that we cannot process, right? So the fact that your car is in the driveway is evidence that I have that you're home, but it's not evidence that my son, who's three-year-old, has that you're home because he can't process the support relation between the car being in the driveway and you being at home. And I also want to say that evidence is not available to you if the kind of epistemic agent that you are can't access or process the support relation. So is that that's the, the, the type constraint, the qualitative constraint is about both access and processing. Uh, there are also going to be quantitative limitations on my information accessing and processing. The case of the arith arithmetical truths uh, uh, is in a way like that, in another way is qualitative because they're just types of truths that I can't access because of my limitations. But they're also, um, the, the one important limitation is quantitative. I can't uh, form beliefs about all arithmetical truths. Um, uh, the fact that there's a table somewhere towards the peri periphery of my visual field uh, is hard for me to process because there's a lot of stuff going on in my visual field, right? So I can't process everything that's happening in my visual field. I can process stuff that's right in front of me, but stuff that's towards the limits, I'm not going to be able to form beliefs about because there's just too much stuff. Uh, and similarly, while I might easily access um, separate facts, F, F1, F2, it might be too hard for me to uh, access their conjunction. The conjunction might be too long. Um, so that's a quantitative limitation. And there are also going to be environmental limitations on availability uh, in that our environment, both physical and social, is structured in particular ways such that more some facts are more available to us than others. So, you know, I'm, for instance, given how my natural environment is structured, I'm supposed to look for crocodiles in the lake, but not in my fridge, because in my natural environment, cro crocodiles are more likely to be in the lake than in the fridge. Uh, so, you know, if I'm in front of the lake and I tell you that I have no idea that there are crocodiles, even though they're, you know, visible, then... Uh, there's, I'm resistant to evidence. If I have crocodiles in my fridge and I don't search for them, I'm not resistant to, to evidence. Uh, similarly, our social environment is also going to st uh, structure this availability constraint in that we are supposed to read the newspaper on the table in front of us, but not the letter under the doormat, which explains why whatever is written on the front page of the newsletter can be a defeater to my beliefs in a way in which a letter under the doormat can't, because my social environment is just such that I can't read everything because I'm limited and my social environment is such that written testimony is more likely to be present in the newspaper than under the doormat. Um, so that's an environmental uh, constraint. So in a nutshell, what I want to say is that this availability constraint uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be something along these lines. A piece of evidence E is available to S if and only if S has a cognitive process with the function of generating knowledge that can qualitatively, quantitatively, and environmentally easily uptake E, incognizers of S's type. So the kind of person that you are has a cognitive process that they can use to pick up these facts uh, easily. Uh, that's, that's roughly the account of, of availability um, that's supposed to, to, to play a part in this, uh, in this view. So the upshot of all of this uh, is that both the practical and the representational function uh, that we wanted met to begin with are uh, met. Uh, in that the view picks out both accountability and attributability. So let me explain how. So first of all, it is knowledge-based. So you're not going to get the accidental correlation problem that the full conception of evidence had, 
right? So in that, it's going to pick out attributability. The, ev the evidence of my account, so Mona evidence, is going to uh, be able to pick out attributability whenever, you know, it's going to be intuitive for folk to say, uh, George has evidence, my account is going to predict that the, the truth of that attribu attribution. Uh, uh, we have an availability constraint, right? So the, the result is uh, that we're not going to have this availability issue that the default account used to have. Uh, remember that the default account didn't constrain availability, um, which, you know, made it very hard to use uh, in practice. Uh, so also, and also evidence on my view are going to be facts, uh, not mental states. So they're not just any facts, they're facts that raise the probability of knowledge, but they're not mental states. They're outside of our skull, which is going to make it such that I don't have problems to, with resistance to evidence and uh, normative defeat, uh, right? So when I am, as a, you know, I'm the, the detective, I'm ignoring probability razors that are lying in pl plain view, uh, that doesn't get me off the hook according my account will predict that I have evidence, even if I don't take it up because I'm biased against it uh, or whatever. So in a nutshell, I think that if we're going to engineer our conception of evidence in an unificatory way to take the best things from the full conception and the best things from the, you know, 2000 years of epistemological theorizing about evidence and bring them together, what we're going to get is maybe not only my account, but an account along these lines, right? So in a way, even if you don't like my account, maybe you like my general recipe. The general recipe needs to be having evidence it is not in the skull. Uh, it's something that's, that's happening in the world, but it's not completely unrelated to the skull either, to the agent, as it were. It needs to be the kind of thing that agents of my kind are able to pick up. So that's, that's roughly what I wanted uh, to say. Thanks a lot. <laughs>